Okay, welcome back to another edition of True Detective Talk. This is episode 12 already. By this uh, rate, we'll get to 100 in no time. So today we're going to talk a little bit about Bill Nagara, my death row inmate that we uh, we talked to yesterday. I'm sure everybody has watched that by now. Most people have. Um, we're going to talk about a little bit of a mystery called the Hannibal Boys. I don't know if any of you are aware of that mystery of three uh, boys aged 11, 13, and 14 gone missing uh, in 1967. And uh, I'm going to answer some of your questions because there's a lot of them about uh, the San Quentin interview. And that'll be it for today. Uh, it's very snowy today here in Pennsylvania. Bit of a storm. So I got this really long driveway to get to my house and uh, I had to plow it and it takes a while so I'm a little bit tired but I'm back in the warmth you know I got the wood stove kicking I got all the wood brought in it's nice and dry I'm semi dry my feet seem to be a little chilly but I will survive so let's talk Bill Nagara. So yesterday you found out that, that is who I've been talking to. It's been, I guess it's not, it's not a secret. I just didn't feel any need to let people know who it was that I've been working with for the past five months. Now, like Bill said, he reached out to me. And you guys had asked why. And how did he find me? Well, I was just as shocked as you were when I'm at home and I check my post office box and there's a letter in there and uh, it's from an assistant a lawyer something of bills and that started the whole ball rolling I got an email and then it just he wanted to speak with me about some cold cases and you know how did he pick me I asked the exact same question <laughs> I said, is my name getting thrown around San Quentin death row? Because if it is, I need to know. Um, you know, just because, I, I, why, you know? And he said, well, to be honest with you, I watched you on television on the hunt for the Zodiac killer. So apparently they have TV because I said, you, you don't get, you don't have internet access there. So how did you find me? He said, you're correct, but we do have television. And I saw your series, Hunt for the Zodiac Killer, and you impressed me. And I thought, hey, this is a guy I want to work with. Because Bill had knowledge of some cold cases. Not a shocker, right? I mean, the guy's been locked up 40 years in San Quentin death row. He talks to inmates, serial killers every day. Um, and he wanted my thoughts on some things. And we discussed and we have been discussing for a number of months and then it turned into well I think we could maybe expand this right from just me and you talking to my fan base and get them involved let them listen because I felt that he had a lot to offer okay now if if after two conversations with Bill, had I thought he was not knowledgeable, was not trustworthy, was not um, capable of giving correct information that could help in these cases, I, I would have never contacted him. You know, I've been done with him. I've cut people out of my life for less than that. So, I'm just telling you that I have felt he had something to offer. Cold cases, victims' families, me, which in turn kind of helps the entire 
Now, that's a little too too much to say to say it helps the entire judicial system. I, I would just say, stick to saying it helps. If it helps me, it's going to help the victims' families and it's going to help these cases. Okay. I've always been about being able to see things through different lenses, and, and I can't do that. You know, like I I want to see. I want to see an autopsy report through a forensic pathologist's eyes. So when I read it, it says one thing to me. It visualizes one thing to me. But when I have a, friends, a forensic pathologist read it to me and explain it to me, what he sees, it's totally different, right? So when I see a crime scene, let's say I see, I see a dead female stab wounds, back of a department store, defensive wounds, no sexual assault, but nothing taken. That tells me one thing, right? Okay, well, let me, let me show it to somebody that has actually killed somebody. Killed another female, strangled another female. Now, you look at that. Let me sit back here and you tell me what you see. Oh, really? Now that makes sense. I, I didn't think of that. That's why it's important. So, Bill Nogueira was arrested, what, 1983 when his murders were? 1982, he was 18 years old. He killed his girlfriend's mother. It was, uh, from what I read, now, granted, I didn't get into details about this with Bill um, yet. I knew, I know about his crimes, we talked about his crime, but the details of it, uh, no. When he was talking yesterday about the death penalty because of financial gain, what he was talking about was, allegedly there was a conspiracy between Bill and his girlfriend about killing her mom. Now I think there's some conflict there of why she got killed, whether it was an argument because Bill was not allowed to date her, the daughter, but certainly the prosecution must have proven that it was because they were going to kill her for financial gain, meaning life insurance. The girlfriend was convicted also. I have no idea where she's at. Um, I don't know if Bill does either. But that was the crime. No way I'm going to dismiss that crime. Okay? But when people ask, can people just, just kill and be re rehabilitated? Sure they can. It depends on how they kill. Now, if somebody asked me, do I think Bill would reoffend if he got released from prison? My answer is I can't answer that. Because everybody is put in a different situation. Let's say Bill got out um, and he's walking to a restaurant with his girlfriend. And some guy comes up and, you know, slaps his girlfriend across the face or puts a gun to his girlfriend's head. Could he kill again? In that, given a situation like that? Sure. But he's not a serial offender. He doesn't have the urge to kill. He doesn't kill to satisfy his need to kill or a sexual oppression right there's a big difference killing is wrong we all know that but there are different levels that's why the justice system is set up the way it is with manslaughter third degree second degree first degree premeditated murder that's why it is because some degrees of killing are less than others some are more severe what bill did was absolutely wrong and his ranks somewhere in the middle it wasn't 
it wasn't like he was somebody was breaking into his home and he killed them. No. But it wasn't where he's sexually assaulting a serial he's a serial offender, sexually assaulting and raping and killing women either. Okay? He does take responsibility, which is a which is big in my book. I've talked to a lot of prisoners, okay? And most of them will make excuses of why they're where they are. It's everybody else's fault but theirs. Now, he's an older gentleman now. He's 55, 58, whatever he said he was. Uh, we all grow, right? We don't, we're not the same people we were when we were 19. I know I'm not. I have a lot of the same core beliefs in me, for sure. You know, integrity, character, uh, honor, you know, love, those type of things. I have those that will never change, but I'm a different person. I hung out with different people back then than I do now. I did different things. Still listen to the same music, I got to admit that. Um, but my point being is the things we see beauty in now, like for example, Bill might be art. He probably didn't have that when he was younger. I could give sh two shits about a, a sunset or a beautiful landscape when I was 18, 19 years old. Mine was show me where the next party is, okay? Show me where the next girl is. Show me where the next concert is. Show me where the next baseball diamond is so I can play some ball. That's all I cared about. Now, it's different. I like going outside, sitting on my deck and just looking at the landscape. Playing with my dogs things we change with age right now there I, I went off on a little tangent again but that is the the gist of how I'm feeling about working with Bill I think it's a great uh, coming together of minds in order to solve cool cases so next week I'm gonna give him another case I don't know which one yet there's so many and, and it's gonna be a case that I've looked at already Okay, because I want to see if he sees what I see. Idaho murders, he sees exactly what I see. Now, he's a little more definitive on some things where I don't think he should be, but that's him. You know, example is the age. He's probably right within that age group. Um, another thing about him being inside the house. I think it's very possible, but I'm not going to, I wouldn't go there yet. I didn't see anything to show me that yet. But I know what he means by, hey, girls are in their room. They're on their phone. They're texting. They're calling. The lights are probably on. Um, it's risky going in then. If you go in when nobody was there and you just wait till they go to sleep, yeah, I, I, I understand, but I'm not willing to go there yet. So that's how I feel about that. We'll do more talking about Bill and I and our cases as we go forward here, but I thought yesterday's talk went really well. It was very well received. Uh, we'll see what happens. Uh, I've talked to Fox News this morning again, uh, twice, two different people. Uh, Newsweek again. We'll see. We'll see what, how this all plays out. Um, but thank you guys for your support, your comments. Uh, I love them. They're uh, very genuine. I'm glad you guys enjoyed this, the, the first episode. The intro. Yes, I made that intro. I'm a, I'm a jack of all trades, but a master of none. That's how I like to describe myself. So, that intro took me a while to come up with. It's a lot of creative stuff, you know. It's like, uh, it's much, I, I equate it to songwriting and making a song. I find that fascinating, how artists can do that. Uh, I, it's the same thing with me. I just want to, I have a vision, I want to create it. I've been off, thinking about doing a documentary. And I... I written it down actually it's right over there a couple pages of my vision how I want to see things 
and it's very hard getting other people to see your own vision and doing things the way you want it done that's why a lot of times I just do things myself like I've said before because I know it's gonna get done right up to my expectation level that's why when I have a private investigative business I told you I fired everybody because they just weren't living up to my expectations I ran the narcotics unit you know I fired a couple people for the same reason they wanted me to hire certain people they didn't have the ethic and the integrity level that I wanted therefore is one of the reasons I left kept pushing me to hire this guy hire this guy he's a state policeman he, and boy, yeah, I know who he is but I, I, I don't like his ethics he's done things that I just borderline I don't want that in my unit I'm, you're not going to force me to hire him. Well, they hired him. But after I said, you know what, then take him. I'm out of here. I, you know, I didn't, I didn't need it. I had other things going on. So, um, anyhow, that's that. I want to talk about another intriguing case here. So, this is called the Hannibal Boys. These are three kids that miss, went missing from Hannibal, Missouri on May 10th, 1967. Now, I started to talk about this yesterday, and but I got sidetracked when I said Steve Cedarwall called me. This, this is the reason he called me. He's kind of working on this case. And so I researched it a little bit because it was intriguing to me. Those boys, Billy Hogue, Joe Hogue, and Craig Dow, who Steve Cedarwall knew. They all went missing on May 10, 1967. Never seen again. Three boys. Now what were they doing up to that point? They were going spelunking. Which, for those that don't know, is going into caves. There was a cave opening that had opened it up because they were doing some highway construction. They had been warned not to go. Parents told them not to go. Actually, the Construction workers chased them away, but apparently there was one schoolboy or a witness that saw them either at the mouth of the cave or going in the cave. Now the boys took with them a shovel and some flashlights. They searched those caves for those boys for uh, like three days straight. They brought in expert spelunkers and no no trace of them it's just amazing to me how nobody how, how people can just disappear off the face of the earth missing persons are the most frustrating cases you'll ever work when there's no sign of them these three boys it's just heartbreaking to me so the point here is what happened to them well, most people assume that they they got trapped in that cave. The cave gave way because they were doing the construction. The walls were weakened and they were suffocated or um, buried alive in those caves. And that's a horrible thought. We had a cave where I grew up in Center Hall, Pennsylvania. It was within a quarter mile of my house. I used to walk to it because it was at the end of where our bus stop was and I went in there with some friends before just being just like these kids very mischievous kinda exploring type thing not really afraid of anything and I was only 14 13 and I gotta admit it was a bit scary after I got in there and some of the you know I'm kinda claustrophobic and being in there and thinking that this, this could collapse at any point in time and going through some narrow channels where you can barely get through thinking you could get stuck at any minute and nobody would find you oh it's a horrible feeling it's a horrible thought luckily I made it to the end of the cave the end of the rainbow which was some water that was in there that we wanted to see and made it back out my parents knew what I was doing. I would have been in so much trouble, but <laughs> that's how boys are. And these boys were the same way. Maybe that's why it hits me a little bit. You know what I mean? Yeah. But apparently after 
I don't know, 20 years, a new theory is brought forth, 30 years, 40 years, that John Wayne Gacy, yes, the killer clown, is responsible for these murders. So Steve told me that, and I just took it with a grain of salt, and he mentioned some psychics finding whatever it was. You know, when I hear psychics and I hear a serial killer involved, uh, I just kind of, all right. Well, I researched it. All right, let me see what's going on here. And I find out that an author who lived in the town of Hannibal actually knew these boys, I think. When he grew up, he wrote a book, and he was approached by three different psychics who told them that John Wayne Gacy is responsible for these murders. Right there, it just shuts me down. Okay? Why are psychics coming up with John Wayne Gacy's name if law enforcement or the FBI or whoever investigated this never came up with that name? These three psychics supposedly led him uh, to the same location, all three of them differently at separate times. It's just a bunch of horse shit. Okay? Uh, you ever watch oh, The Amazing Randy? If you ever get a chance, please search him on YouTube. This is a guy that debunks all these psychics. That guy's half my hero. He offers a million dollars to anybody that can prove their psychic abilities. Not one person. Not one. You'd think if they're out there, they would come claim that. And he, he videotapes it, you know, and he debunks them all. Now listen, I believe in some of the stuff like, you know, you know, we give off energy and maybe some things like that because we I just don't know everything, right? But I I don't I just don't believe in psychics. I think it's a bunch of horse shit. They're charlatans. I'd never use one. Never. Okay? But these psychics say John Wayne Gacy did it. So the author looked into it a little bit, and apparently John Wayne Gacy in 1967 lived in Waterloo, Iowa, and his mom lived uh, somewhere else. But guess what? Just like anything else you can make fit, Hannibal, Missouri was on the way, and Highway 61 or whatever it was was what you took to get there. Therefore, John Wayne Gacy is involved. Cut the bullshit. Why do you promote such bullshit? Waterloo, Iowa is four hours away. So John Gacy lived four hours away from Hannibal where these boys disappeared. Four hours! And he isn't even at his mom's yet where he supposedly, you know, traveled. So what? He's just going to decide, you know what? four hours I've just driven I am very tired I'm gonna pull off the road and I see three boys in, in broad daylight here and I'm just gonna take them to the woods and and kill them now not to mention that John Wayne Gacy didn't kill his first victim until 1972 not to mention that most of John Wayne Gacy's 33 victims were from the age of 14 to 21. Here we got an 11-year-old and a 13-year-old, and one 14. It, do, it doesn't match. It doesn't fit. It's the same with Jeffrey Dahmer being responsible for Adam Walsh. Whenever there is an unsolved crime, we as society, well, I shouldn't say we because not me, but some people, want to point fingers at a serial offender when 99% of the time that is completely false. Now there are some, there's 1%. You can't just place the blame and make connections when they're, when they're not there. This, this, this makes no sense. It makes no sense. John Wayne Gacy drugged his victims, got them to his house usually one-on-one. -on -one. 
Here you have three boys. Now you certainly can control three boys. If you have a gun, you can murder all of them. That doesn't fit his MO. Ludicrous to me. Absolutely. But hey, that's just Kenny Maines' opinion on it. I'm sure you can find others that would disagree with me. It happens all the time. I think those three boys are in that cave system somewhere. That's my opinion. Because how come the shovel was never found? John Wayne Gacy killed these kids, abducted them. He, what's he going to do? Take the shovel too? Makes no sense. Use your head. Okay. Questions. I'm trying to get to a couple here. Wow, I've been a subscriber for, I think, a year now. I had no idea there was a series on Monday. Yes, I did a whole week on Monday. Please, I implore you guys, go back through my old videos. Every famous case that you can think of, i probably done already. Just go back and look. I don't know how you do it. I don't know whether you search, scroll, but go back. There's some good stuff there. Darley Routier, Jeff McDonald was the best case I think that I did, and Sam Shepard. That was another really good one that I think I, I nailed. Um, some that I didn't do so good on, I think, uh, like uh, Ray Rivera. I just I questioned myself on that one. But there's some really good ones there, so go back and look. That oh, pisses me off that this man talking about Bill Nagara was 18, no other crimes, and got death when today thousands of murders get nothing to 20 years. Now I hear you. The justice system is just, it is, it is crazy. I will tell you that. This is extremely important information. Thank you and the inmate. I hope that Idaho law enforcement watches this. I sincerely doubt that they're going to be watching anything that I do. That's just my guess. Ken, I would love to hear your perspective on the female Dallas police officer who walked into the wrong apartment and she shot and killed an innocent man. I do remember that. Uh, I don't know enough about it to really comment. Other than, I don't know how she can walk in a different apartment that's not hers and shoot somebody. <laughs> I mean, you, unless you're drunk. I don't know. Please ask Bill what he thinks about this being sex trafficking attempt gone wrong. What are your thoughts, Ken? I think he covered it, and I think I've covered it in past videos. That's not sex trafficking gone wrong. It was a targeted attack, more than likely. The whole plan was to kill whoever was the target then and there. And, that, and that's it. You know, if you go back and look at my Delphi videos where I said I thought it was an attempted kidnapping, abduction, and then the probable cause affidavit came out and told me where the guy's car was parked, and I wasn't sure, but I'm, I'm still... Still not sure because of Keegan Klein's interview that he gave. Uh, still, could be attempted, attempted kidnapping. Not sure yet. Oh, let's do one more, and that is it. Let's see if I can find one. I thank you guys for all these comments, and I'm going to do a, another video with just answering all your questions. I will. There's no doubt about it because there's so many. I got guys from Scotland watching this, a police chief there. I appreciate that, chief. If you ever need any help, please let me know. That goes for all law enforcement. If you have cases you just want a second opinion on, give me a shout. That's what I do. Okay, I just get a lot of statements, not a lot of questions here. That always happens. Like when I get on and I look at questions, I'm like, oh, there's some good questions. And then when I get here and I start going through them, I can't find any of them. How is he a pro fighter and got a degree? I mean, I know they can do it in prison, but the fighting part. 
Yeah, I believe he got his degree in prison. I'm not sure, but if you go to his web page, you'll see pictures of him as a as a professional fighter or a fighter. You know, I didn't check into it. If he says he was a professional fighter, I don't. You know, I, I take his word for it. And I don't know why he would lie about that. Here's a question for Bill, but I'll answer it for Bill. Does him being on your channel in any way put him in harm's way at San Quentin? I'll, I'm sure it does. You know, I'm sure. But he chooses this, and, uh, you know, you're in harm's way no matter what in San Quentin. I firmly believe that. But if inmates found out maybe that he was helping me, yeah, maybe. Yeah, he'd have a target on his back. But, uh... I mean, if that's something Bill chooses to do, he chooses to do it, you know. So, yeah, I'm guessing, I'm guessing so. Ken, I love your show and taste in music. Have you visited the Leonard Skinner Memorial in Gillsburg? No, I would like to go. I would love to go. So, if somebody wants to take me, somebody that's in Gillsburg, knows somebody that owns the farm there, get a hold of me. I would love to to go. Uh, very interesting. Looking forward to hearing more from this man. Okay, fantastic video. Love the insight. This is really interesting. Just a thought. Would you be doing a Q&A with Mr. Nagara? Yes. Yeah. I'm going to do that. I'll uh, get your questions to him on one episode. I don't know when. We'll get it done. Somebody said great guest. Very interesting. Can't wait for the next episode. If serial killers are born that way, then why does the U.S. have over 27 per capita more than the country in second place? That's a good question. That's a good way to put that. Um, I will ask him that, why he thinks that. Because I think, I think it's a combination of both. I, I, that's what I believe. Nature and nurture. Detective Maines, do you or your jail contact think that the sicko that skinned a dog approximately three weeks before the murders is related? I originally said, well, yeah, I believe that it probably is until law enforcement ruled it out. They said, no, it's not. So now i got to take their word for it. Uh, Bill says it's definitely not related. So, I hope that answers your question on that. Absence makes the heart grow fonder. Sometimes it sure does. I was wondering why I like a nice cold beer after our not having one for a couple months. I guess you answered that for me. Thank you, Ken. Please tell the inmate that he was much appreciated. Love the new intro. Yeah. Wailing in the Tulsa King. Yeah. Fascinating. I really enjoyed listening to this. I wish they would put out more episodes of Mindhunter. Mindhunter was a fabulous series. I really enjoyed that as well. I didn't. The first episode I stopped. Um, but then I got back into it and it got really, really good. You know, it's not on Sopranos level. You know, that's top for me. It's hard to beat. Friday Night Lights was a great series that I didn't think I'd like. I loved the movie and I read the book. I didn't think I'd like the series. Loved the series. The Wire from HBO, most realistic narcotics uh, television series I watched. I was working undercover at the time watching that and I thought everything was just so realistic. Um, so those are some TV shows. Ray Donovan, great show, great show. So those are some of my TV series along with Mindhunter, you know, that I really enjoyed. Love the intro. Last question here. Do serial killers consider themselves to be victims in any ways? Yeah. Yeah. 90% of them probably. It's always somebody else's fault. Um, it's rare to find somebody that 
owns up to it and says, hey, I don't, a lot of them have said, I don't know why I'm built this way, but I am. And these is, this is what I did. Um, and, and admit and stand up for what they did wrong, but not many. So everybody I've ever met in jail for the most part has said they're a victim. It's everybody else's fault, but theirs. But there are plenty out there that take ownership just like Bill did. So, all right, that's it for True Detective Talk. Guns and Roses, hey, Axel, I know you don't do a lot with media and stuff, but you can always talk to me, buddy. So I'll have you on anytime you want. Mains out.